Philippians chapter 3. Let's look at verses 15 through 21 this morning. Verses 15 through 21. The Apostle Paul, through the inspiration of the Holy Spirit, said, Let us therefore, as many as be perfect, be thus minded. And if in anything ye be otherwise minded, God shall reveal even this unto you. Nevertheless, whereto we have already attained, let us walk. By the same rule, let us mind the same thing. Brethren, be followers together of me, and mark them which walk so as ye have us for an example. For many walk, of whom I have told you often, and now tell you even weeping, that they are the enemies of the cross of Christ." whose end is destruction, whose God is their belly, and whose glory is in their shame, who mind earthly things. For our conversation is in heaven, from whence also we look for the Savior, the Lord Jesus Christ, who shall change our vile body, that it may be fashioned like unto his glorious body, according to the working whereby he is able even to subdue all things unto himself. Let's pray. Lord, thank you for your word. Lord, it is so helpful for us. And Lord, there is such an important message here this morning. And Lord, we can be so distracted with our lives, with the activities of the day, with different things. Lord, just still our hearts right now. Blot out those distractions. Help us focus on what your word has to say. Help us focus on the truths of this passage. Lord, help me to preach your word with clarity and with authority. And just bless this time as we think and dwell and meditate in your word. I ask this in your son's name. Amen. I have an older brother. He's five years older than me. So when I was around 11 or 12 years old, my brother Tom got his driver's license. He was 16. I remember he had a little Ford Ranger truck, and I used to ride with him. And when it was just me and Tom, Tom liked to drive kind of recklessly. I remember he'd like to see how fast that truck could go, kind of max it out on the back crunchy roads. But I remember one particular day after school, we had dropped some kids off um, back home, and we were coming down a dirt road. And Tom was having a good time, so he was kind of fishtailing back and forth. Just, you know, what 16-year-olds do on a back road. And uh, so as an 11-year-old, I'm in the passenger seat, and I'm enjoying it. You know, we're kind of, go, you know, spinning around. And next thing I know, the fishtail got increasingly jerky. And suddenly I look, and we are about to fall into this ditch on the right side. So I yelled out, Tom, the ditch! So he quickly corrected Well, he uh, overcorrected. And the next thing I know, I look over, and we're about to go in the ditch on the left side. I said, Tom, the ditch! And he corrected again, and luckily, he stabilized the car, and and, uh, the first words out of his mouth is, do not tell mom and dad that happened. I said, don't worry, I won't. I want to keep having fun in this car. I won't say anything to mom and dad. But I still remember that day, and I remember thinking how quick you can go from a danger on one side of a road to a danger on another side of the road, can't you? You know, life is kind of has certain issues that are kind of like roads where there's a ditch in both directions. There's many issues where danger exists when we go to the far extremes in either direction, to the right or to the left. If you've been here, and I know some of you are visiting, we've been going through this Philippians chapter 3, and the Apostle Paul is talking about the topic of salvation through faith. And he's talking about the idea of works. And in verses 12 through 14, the last message, Paul talked about how important it is as believers that we're still working. We're not working for our salvation, but we're working to become like Christ, to be conformed to Christ. We're working because God has chosen us for good works. He's predestined us for good works. Paul is dealing with this attitude that because we have Christ's righteousness, we can sit back and do whatever we want and not try and not put forth any effort. And that's a dangerous view, isn't it? 
that, oh, I said a prayer when I was four years old, and now I can live however I want. That's not biblical. And that's what Paul is addressing. Paul says, no, I press towards the mark. I'm always striving to grow in the Lord. And then we saw two weeks ago in verses 1 through 11 how Paul talked about the danger on the other side. The the other side is the danger of work salvation. People who feel like they have faith in Christ, but they also have to add their good works to that faith to be saved. And Paul said, no, that is wrong. We are saved by faith alone. Nothing you do will help your salvation. Your, Your salvation is totally based on the work of Jesus Christ. So Paul here, he's warning. He's warning the church of Philippi. There's a ditch on both sides. And that's the title of my message this morning is a ditch on both sides. On this issue of works and salvation, there is dangerous teaching in both directions. So Paul wants the church in Philippi to stay balanced and to stay biblical about this issue. And after explaining the flaws in both of these and talking about both ones, in the conclusion of this chapter, the verses we just read, what Paul is doing is he's encouraging the church on how they can maintain a biblical thinking about work. So this morning, let's look at, in this passage, three ways you should maintain biblical thinking about works. The first thing we're going to see in verses 15 through 16 is you must pursue biblical thinking. You must pursue biblical thinking. Let's look at verses 15 and 16 again. Paul says, Let us therefore, as many as be perfect, be thus minded. What's he saying there? That word perfect is the idea of mature. So as many of us as are spiritually mature... This is how we need to think. What is, what is he talking about? He's talking about this biblical view of salvation by faith and yet working to become like Christ. This balanced view of works, this balanced biblical view of salvation. He says, this is how we need to think. He says, and if anything ye be otherwise minded... God shall reveal even this unto you. What does he mean there? He's saying that if you are off in one direction or the other on this, if you're having misconceptions in one way or the other, as you grow, God is going to help bring you to an understanding of this. How does God do this? How does God bring us to a fuller, clearer, more accurate understanding on issues like this? He does it through his word, doesn't he? You know, in scripture, there are passages of the Bible that emphasize the importance of works, isn't there? I can think of the book of James talks about it. It talks about how faith without works is dead. Do you remember that passage? And there's other passages throughout the the New Testament that talk about the utter uselessness of works. I think it was Paul that said, my righteousness is as filthy rags. So as a young believer, it may be easy, especially maybe the first time reading through the Bible, to read one passage and to get skewed in that direction. And Paul is saying, as you grow in your understanding and your maturity and your understanding of Scripture, you will become more biblical in this area. It's important for us as believers that we compare Scripture with Scripture. Many of the flaws in people's theology and their thinking, is when they take a verse, they take it out of context, and they run with it. And as believers, we need to be saturated with God's word. And what that means is we're reading significant portions of scripture on a regular basis that is helping us to understand what the Bible really says. Paul is encouraging them here. If you're off base on this, God will help you as you grow. God will reveal your wrong thinking in this area. Look at verse 16. He says, Nevertheless, whereto we have already attained, let us walk by the same rule. Let us mind the same things. So he says, for those of us who are thinking right about this, we understand that salvation is by faith. We understand that we are still called unto good works. Those that are thinking right, let us maintain that. Let us hold fast to that. You know, we are all tempted to drift, aren't we? 
And in this area, in this topic, there is a temptation to be pulled one ditch to the other, to be pulled a direction. As Paul is saying, if you are on the correct page, if you're thinking biblically, keep thinking biblically about this. And then he says, let us mind the same thing. By the same rule, let us mind the same thing. He's saying there needs to be unity about this. You know, it's important for us as a church here at Calvary Baptist Church, if we're going to have unity, we need to be unified around what salvation is. This is an extremely important topic. If this whole section here believes salvation is by faith, and this whole section over here is working for your salvation, that's not going to go well, is it? We need to be unified about what the Bible teaches about this topic. And it's very important. And that's what Paul is telling the church at Philippi here. We need to be proactive on this topic to make sure we understand what Scripture says. You know, when Misty and I were in the South, we were in in South Carolina for four years, and we were in what you would call the Bible Belt. In fact, they called it the buckle of the Bible Belt. If you're not familiar with that terminology, it's very Christian in South Carolina. And there's more Baptist churches like You can stand in one spot and see three or four Baptist churches from any I mean, it's literally corner after corner after corner there's Baptist churches. But I was amazed as I talked to people and interacted with strangers. And I would ask people, do you know for sure you go to heaven if you die? And they say, yes, I know for sure. And I say, how do you know for sure you go to heaven if you die? Do you know what the most common response was? My uncle was a preacher. That's what people would say. Oh, my granddaddy, he was a preacher. Or often we'd hear, well, I pray at night. All kinds of responses. In the buckle of the Bible Belt, many people, when I'm asking them, are you saved? Are you born again? Do you know for sure you're going to heaven when you die? The first thing they go to was Uncle Willie was a preacher. Now, I think what they're trying to say is, is, I was, I've grown up a Christian, I've been exp- in church, I've been exposed. But just to hint you in, that's not a real good answer, is it? Because that you can go to church your entire life and die and go to hell. Going to church does not save you, folks. That has nothing to do with salvation by faith. And what I'm dealing with, what I was dealing with was a bunch of people who lived in a Christian culture But they did not have a biblical sound understanding of this very topic that Paul's talking about, about salvation, about works, how they work and how they interplay. They did not understand that. Now, I don't want to be too hard on people. I know when you put somebody on the spot, you can get nervous, catch people off guard. So I'm not judging those individual people. You know, it's it's a nerve wracking thing when somebody suddenly confronts you about your spiritual condition. So I'm not looking down on them. But you know what I've rarely heard when I ask somebody, do you know for sure you're going to heaven when you die? Once in a while, but it was very rare that someone would say, yes, I know for sure because I am trusting in Jesus Christ as my Savior. Ding, 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 ding. That's the right answer. Paul here, he wants them to pursue biblical thinking and understand what they believe and why they believe it. And here at Calvary Baptist Church, we want that for you. We want you to understand what you believe and why you believe it, especially in this topic right here about salvation, about works, because there's so many varying views out there about this, and we want you to understand. So if somebody asks you, do you know for sure you're saved, or if you died today, would you go to heaven? The exact words you say are not important, but the idea is important. So something like, I'm trusting in Jesus' finished work on the cross for my salvation. That's the right answer. And as believers, we should be ready to share that. Scripture says we should be ready to share the hope that lies within us. Maybe somebody will say to you, well, if you believe you're saved in all that and you're going to heaven no matter what, does that mean you can live however you want? Have you ever heard anybody say that? Well, you're telling me if you say a prayer, you can live any way you want. Are you prepared to answer that? Are you prepared to give an answer? It's a good question somebody might have. 
What did Paul say? You were, maybe you were here last week. He said, no, you cannot live however you want. We must pursue good works. So maybe you could say something like, I'm trying to be a good person because I want to be like my Savior. Or maybe you could say something like, I'm trying to do good works, not to, for my salvation, but because God saved me for a purpose and he wants to change me. Or maybe you could say, I'm trying to do good because God gave me a desire to obey him. There's lots of different things you could say, but do you understand this concept? The Apostle Paul thinks it's very important for the church of Philippi, and I believe it's very important for us. And so what Paul's saying here, if you want to stay balanced, if you want to stay down the right path, you need to pursue biblical thinking about this topic. He gives another reason in verses 17 through 19. Let's look at look at those verses. The second thing this morning is you must be careful who you follow. If you're taking notes, you must be careful who you follow. Paul says, brethren, be followers together of me and mark them which walk so as ye have us for an example. There's some difficult wording there. Let me just simplify it. Paul is saying, Christians at the church at Philippi, I follow me. I am doing my best at this example. I'm trying to be your example. And here's what you need to do. You need to find people who are agreeing biblically with this, and you need to follow them. That's what he's saying. Paul is encouraging the believers to learn from those who have the right thinking on this topic. So quickly, let's just talk about what does it mean to follow a person in a biblical way? Because Paul's saying, follow me. What does that mean? I, I jotted down a few thoughts here. Number one, we need to observe their way of life. If you see somebody who is biblical in their teaching and biblical in their life, we need to watch that person. We need to follow their leadership. We need to learn from their choices. And fourthly, we need to give more weight and credibility to the things they say. These are people who are speaking biblically, and their actions are backing up the words they say. Now, what does it not mean to follow somebody biblically, to follow a man? Well, it does not mean we worship them. And there's a lot of that going on, isn't there? It's like, especially we love in America, we love celebrity worship, don't we? Ooh, they're famous. So if a Christian gets famous suddenly, oh, they're the greatest. No, that's not what it's talking about here. We're not worshiping people. We also have the tendency to put somebody on a pedestal, don't we? What does that mean? It means you hold somebody up so high in your mind that you think they're on a different level or a different plane. My dad always had a saying, it's a common saying, he says, they put their pants on one leg at a time just like I do. You know, we're all humans. And though it's good to take the Apostle Paul or somebody in your life that you look up to spiritually, maybe someone that led you to Christ or a grandparent who's a wise saint, and to look up to them, you know what, they're still human. So be careful. They're also still a sinner. So don't base your faith, don't base your reliability and your emotional stability on that person. But Paul is recognizing here that people have influence on us. And he's also recognizing that as Christians, we need good examples we can look up to, don't we? And I'm thankful that in this church that we have people that I can look up to. There's many of you in this room that I consider you a mentor or not only a friend, but people I look up to spiritually that I'm following your example. And we need that as Christians because we are prone to go off to one side or the other. So we need people who are biblically sound that we can follow. Look at verse 18. Paul is saying, not only do we need good examples, but we also need to be very careful about watching out for bad influences. Verse 18, Paul says, For many walk, of whom I have told you often, and now tell you even weeping. He's getting serious. He's getting in emotional here about the importance of this that they are enemies of the cross of Christ, whose end is destruction, whose God is their belly, and whose glory is in their shame, who mind earthly things. So equally important as marking good examples is also to identify people 
that are going to have a negative influence. These are people whose way of life is not consistent with the teaching of Scripture. Verse 19 gives them good descriptions here. And it talks about how their, their focus is on pleasure. They have a perverted sense of morality. They are earthly and materialistic. They're carnal. That's what he's saying there. He says, they who mind earthly things. These are people who are not spiritual, not biblically minded. They may have the appearance, they're religious, they may sound good, but really, they're very carnal, very earthly. Many of you probably have heard the name Ravi, Ravi Zacharias. In recent years, there was some very sad developments that happened. After he passed away, Ravi Zacharias was a famous, very influential Christian apologist. He went all over the world and all over different countries, um, arguing for the Christian faith. And, and he was also had a lot of influence in higher education I think it was either Harvard or Yale. Uh, he had a big impact. But Ravi Zacharias had a huge following. Shortly after his death, it came out that Ravi Zacharias had been immoral with numerous women for over a decade prior to his death. And that he was a very sensual and honestly a very wicked man. How sad of a situation that was. How unfortunate for the name of Christ. But in the report, the, his organization did a report on his life, and they talked about one thing that was a major red flag of his life, is that Ravi Zacharias did not and was not part of a local church. He had such a ministry traveling the world that when he was not traveling and not speaking in a church, he was just home. He had no regular local congregation that he attended when he was not ministering. That is a perfect example of somebody who is claiming to be spiritual, who's claiming to be biblical, and yet their life's actions do not line up with the clear teaching of Scripture. The Bible says, forsake not the assembling of yourselves together. As believers, we are commanded to be in our local assembly. And you take a person like him who has a, from an outward appearance, very good, but yet he was openly violating scripture. What a sad situation, but a, what a warning for us as believers that we need to watch out for who we're following, don't we? We do not just mindlessly follow people and, oh, this person's great. I just believe everything they say. It doesn't matter who it is. If it's me, if it's Pastor Snyder, somebody on the radio, somebody on YouTube. No, we are to judge everything they say and do off Scripture. So I just urge you this morning as Christians, it's good to seek out people that you can look up to. It's good to have examples of people who are biblical. But we need to be very careful of who we're listening to and who we're following. And this is crucial for us to stay thinking biblically. Let's look at the third and final thing this morning in verses 20 through 21. The third thing we should do here is you must maintain a spiritual focus. Let's look at verses 20 and 21. Paul says, For our conversation is in heaven. From whence also we look for the Savior, the Lord Jesus Christ, who shall change our vile body, that it may be fashioned like unto his glorious body, according to the working whereby he is able even to subdue all things unto himself. Paul's saying here, unlike these wicked false teachers who are earthly, as believers, we need to maintain a spiritual focus. In verse 20 there, it uses the word conversation. Now, that word conversation, the Greek word there, this is the only use of it in Scripture. And the idea there is not like just the, the words that come out of your mouth, although that would be included. What he's really talking about here is your manner of life, but also it has an idea of citizenship. If you remember back earlier in the book, Paul talked about this idea of citizenship, that we're citizens of heaven. Do you remember that? Does that ring a bell with anybody? We're citizens of heaven, Paul talked about, and I think it was chapter 1 or 2. And that's the idea here, is our manner of life, 
Our citizenship is in heaven. We have a completely different thinking and a completely different mindset than most people, than lost people. And then he says, he answers the question, why is our focus on heaven? Why are we thinking this way? He says, from whence also we look for the Savior, the Lord Jesus Christ. As believers, we have a spiritual focus, an eternal focus, because we have a Savior who's in heaven, but we also have a Savior who's coming back again. We have a future with our Savior. And look at what it talks about in verse 21. Who shall change our vile body, that it may be fashioned like unto his glorious body. According to the working whereby he is able even to subdue all things unto himself. Our Savior, who we're trusting in, is coming again, and he's going to change our bodies into an immortal body. Amen to that. That is going to be wonderful. You say, okay, I know that's true. What does that have to do with what he's saying? That should color everything we do, folks. We have an eternity in heaven with Christ. That should change the way we think about things, the way we process information, the way we val- the things we value. Our decisions should all be colored with the fact that we have an eternal destiny and we have an eternal existence. And Paul's saying this is crucial here. If we're going to stay thinking right about works, about salvation, we must, we must keep an eternal perspective. Folks, that is so difficult to do, isn't it? We live in a material world. We have our senses. We see the things before us. And yet, if you're a Christian, you know that this is not all there is. There is something more. So we have to be keeping a spiritual and eternal perspective. Imagine with me a moment that you have two brothers that both inherit side-by-side beachfront cottages on Lake Michigan. And for one week of year, these brothers travel to this cottage to enjoy their inheritance and to maintain their inheritance. One of the men is an artist, and he loves making elaborate sandcastles. So the man gets all his equipment, and every year he goes there, and for a week, he makes these beautiful, huge sandcastles in that white beach sand that we have at Lake Michigan. And he makes these beautiful, elaborate sandcastles. And that's how he spends his week, with expressing his art and enjoying himself. And then the other man, though, he's a construction worker. So when he goes for the week, he goes to Home Depot and loads up his truck and He restores the deck, and he's remodeling the living room and investing time and energy into his cottage. Well, naturally, if you think about these two men in similar situations, the rain's going to come, isn't it? And the waves are going to come. And that sandcastle that the one man put so much time and energy into, it's gone, isn't it? Maybe he'll have a picture and he'll have a memory, but a a week of effort, but that thing's not going to last, is it? It's gone. Whereas the other man, he invested in his cottage, and for years to come, he can enjoy the work that he put in. You think, what are you telling me this silly story for? I'm trying to point out the reality that there are huge differences in the eternal value of the things we invest in. And in this scenario, you may look at the man that makes sandcastles and say, buddy, why would you invest so much time and energy to make a sandcastle that's just going to be gone like that? That's a good question. That's a very good question. I ask you this. Why would people who know there is an eternity spend so much time invested in temporary things? We as Christians, we have a spiritual perspective. We know that we're going to be in heaven with God forever. So I ask you, why would we then turn around and spend so much time money and energy on things that have no lasting value. Why would we do that? Well, the answer is that sometimes we fail to have a spiritual focus, don't we? Even though we've been saved, for those of you, I'm assuming most people in this room are saved, that Christ is your Savior, we still struggle with this, don't we? We struggle having an eternal perspective. And Paul is telling the church in Philippi, this is crucial 
for you to think biblically about this issue, for you to stay in between the lines, you've got to have a spiritual perspective. So I ask you this morning, are you living in light of eternity? Or are you preoccupied with the things of this world? One of the most important things we're going to do in this church to maintain being biblical. And we want to be biblical. Do you want to be biblical? I hope so. The most, one of the most important things we're going to do to make, be biblical, besides reading our Bibles, that's important, is we have got to keep an eternal perspective. So this morning, I just want to warn you, like Paul did, there's danger on both sides of this issue. There's danger in legalism in work salvation. There's danger in license, in the idea that you've been saved and you can do whatever you want. Paul's addressed both these issues, and he's given us some important instructions this morning I want you to think about. Are you pursuing biblical thinking? Proactively, are you trying to be biblical in what you believe? Are you reading your Bible? Are you praying? Are you thinking about these things? Are you being careful who you follow? Are you being using discretion in who you listen to? And are you maintaining a spiritual focus? Very important things for us to think about this morning. Let's pray. Lord, thank you for your word. Lord, please forgive us for violating these things. Lord, there's some Christians in this room who have not solidified and understood fully what they believe and why they believe it. Please help them, Lord, to get working towards that. Lord, there's some people in this room who have allowed unbiblical influences in their life. They've listened to teachers that are carnal, that are not spiritual. Lord, help us all to have discretion to to be careful about that. Lord, we are all guilty of getting focused on this earth and on money and on things and on activities and duties And, Lord, we are forgetting often that we're going to stand before you and you're going to judge our works. We're forgetting often that this life is so short. So, Lord, I just pray that your Holy Spirit would work in our lives in these areas. Help us to avoid these dangers. Help us to think biblically. Lord, please work in hearts this morning as we take some time to pray. I ask this in your son's name. Amen. With your heads bowed and your eyes closed. I want to give you some moments to pray. Maybe I'm trusting that the Holy Spirit convicted you about one of these things. Please talk to God. Ask him to help you repent of your failures and ask God to help you in these areas. All right. Thank you for your good attention. Aren't you thankful for God's word? It's going to steer us right, folks. We just got to stay with the word of God. We got to stay in it. We got to read it. We got to listen to it. And it's going to keep us on track. We are all prone to wander, aren't we? This is such good instruction for us today. Pastor Snyder, will you dismiss us in prayer?